Welcome to Counterpoint. I'm Tanya Granick Allen. We've got another great show for you today where we're going to unpack Bill C-11. Recall C-11 is that federal legislation which, if passed, would allow the government to control the flow of information online and would enforce Canadian content restrictions. The bill would give the Canadian Radio Television Telecommunications Commission, or the CRTC, as it's known, greater power to govern and control content on online platforms. Now, there are concerns that this is government overreach, granting the government power to override free speech online. YouTube content creators are concerned with government manipulating algorithms to prioritize Canadian content, thereby affecting their visibility on that platform. And speaking of YouTube, you may have seen the ads YouTube is running in an effort to alert the public to what this bill will do and encouraging Canadians to contact their MPs. But C-11's fate now rests with the Senate, which seems to be taking its time in reviewing this legislation, thankfully. So how would C-11 impact you and your online consumption? How will this impact content production? Will the Senate provide any meaningful amendments to this bill? Well, joining us now is Jay Goldberg, the Ontario and Interim Atlantic Director with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Jay, thanks for coming on today. Uh, so let's hit this right off the bat. How uh, do you feel C-11 will undermine Canadians and their right to express themselves? Well, I think the primary way that, that Bill C-11 is going to undermine Canadians' rights to express themselves online is that the, the government is planning to give the power to the CRTC to filter what we can say and see online and essentially decide what comes up first in our newsfeed and what's last in the newsfeed. And the same thing with streaming feeds. Uh, and so what that means is that the government's really going to be pushing what comes to the top of your feed, uh, what you're most exposed to, what you're most likely to click on. And therefore, it will also bury essentially content that it doesn't promote. And so, you know, we're all very concerned that what this will do is lead to more pro-government content at the top and potentially anti-government contact down at the bottom. Uh, you know, and that piques my interest because, of course, um, you know, many Canadians who have uh, escaped Canadi um, uh, communist countries, they're uh, accustomed to this kind of government interference in, in state broadcasters and what the citizens can hear. When you suggest the government can interfere in, and it sounds like in the algorithms and what we can see, that to me, that sounds very... It sounds like something from, from Russia. Uh, is that really something that is at the precipice here in Canada? Unfortunately, it is. I mean, this is a very dangerous bill. It's also, this is something we haven't seen in any other Western democracy, uh, as we're seeing here in Canada. There are people raising alarms, uh, sounding the alarm all over the country. And the reason is because the government claims that it's giving all of this new power to the CRTC. But it's just going to instruct the CRTC to only reorder what we're seeing online based on whether or not that content is Canadian or considered to be Canadian. Now, we can talk later about how the government's actually really bad at deciding what is Canadian and what isn't. But the point is they're giving the CRTC the power to reorder what's in our feeds. The government says they're only going to do it for Canadian content, but we all know that there's always mission creep when it comes to government. Right. And if government is giving the CRTC the power to reorder our feeds for any reason, and is just saying, hey, CRTC, for now, just do this based on Canadian content, the power is there, the structure is there for the CRTC to filter our content for any reason. And the only way, uh, supposedly, this is going to be limited to Canadian content is just a little promise from the government saying, well, our instructions will be very specific. But we know that a future government or even this government could change their instructions in the future. And if you give a government entity the power to do this, there's a very good chance that it can take up that power in the near future. My goodness. And to be clear, have those ex instructions or these alleged instructions they would pass on to the CRTC, have they been put in writing? No, and that's another thing that's very concerning. The government's just saying, you know, trust us. We're going to give proper instructions for the CRTC. We're going to have very narrow instructions. You really don't have to worry. But when it comes to the government, we do have to worry. We want to see everything in writing. And so one of the really important things that the government should be doing now that they're not is laying out exactly what their instructions to the CRTC will be should this bill pass. Right. And we shouldn't just have to trust them 
We should be able to see in writing what those instructions will be, given the vast powers they're planning to give in terms of censorship to the CRTC. Okay, I'm going to pause you there. We've got to cut to commercial. We'll be right back. Welcome back to CounterPoint, where we're unpacking C11. And joining me again is Jay Goldberg from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Jay, before we went to commercial break, we were discussing how C11 would empower the CRTC with allegedly some vague directions, apparently some specific ones. We don't know. We haven't seen those directions, the directives. Just so our viewers understand who the CRTC is, could you explain, you know, what, who is an appointed body, an elected body? Could you explain that for our viewers? Sure. I mean, it's a government appointed body that essentially helps decide what we see on right now, television and radio, or what we hear on radio, what we see on television. Uh, They have all kinds of regulations in terms of what amount of Canadian content needs to be put on there. Uh, One of the big concerns, though, with giving the CRTC the power to govern the internet is that on radio and television, you have a finite amount of content. There's only so many hours in the day that things can be played. And so therefore, the CRTC plays a role in deciding how much Canadian content needs to be inserted into that process. But as YouTube, its representatives and others have clearly stated, the internet, you can have an unlimited amount of content here. So the fact that the government is trying to prescribe how much Canadian content needs to be online, when online is an infinite universe, uh, where you can have as much content as you want, that's a huge problem. And the CRTC was designed to govern radio, to govern television, because there's a fixed amount of minutes in the day. That's not the case on the internet. And that's just another reason why it makes no sense, other than if you're looking to perhaps censor what Canadians can see online, it makes no sense to give the CRTC the power to govern the internet. Now, we understand that some of these online streaming platforms like Netflix, for example, will then be required to pay some fee to the Canadian government, to the, through the CRTC, I suppose, uh, for, and provide, I guess, directing that towards Canadian content. How would that impact, say, consumers of Netflix? Prices can certainly go up. Uh, there's actually a lot of talk as well about potentially certain streaming platforms blocking the Canadian market altogether because uh, wow. they don't want to have to comply with all of these fees. So Net- the big ones, Netflix hasn't said that, for example, but here in Canada, we, we don't get Hulu, for example, which is an American-based, uh, it's an American-based platform. We, we don't get to keep up with the Kardashians the way that they do in the United <laughs> States. And so, you know, that's one platform that has already decided to block the Canadian market. If you have all kinds of new rules and regulations and potentially fees, there are others that could join that pack. And I should also say, with respect to Netflix, They've invested over a billion dollars in Canadian content creation, and yet the government is just trying to further punish them. Uh, it makes no sense. And, and, you know, there is a risk that this will drive certain platforms out of the Canadian market, or, or they'll just choose not to invest to the same extent that they're investing right now. Now, I, I suppose it's easier to regulate, not that I'm suggesting one should be regulating these things, but things like Netflix, if Hulu were to come here, like Hulu, Crave, things like that. But when you you talked about, you spoke about the internet, and that seems like this big open platform, open source uh, vehicle for Canadians who want to consume maybe alternative media or see different videos or a cooking video or or whatever they like. To know that that may be interfered with, it seems counter, uh, it seems antithetical to what the internet's supposed to do. Uh, how, How is that going to impact, say, Canadian YouTubers, for example? It's going to impact them in a very big way. So the government, I think, is making a huge mistake by extending this to platforms like YouTube. And YouTube has come out and says this is going to damage Canadian content creators. The reality is Canadian content creators rely on markets outside of Canada for 90% of their audience. That's according to YouTube. And so what this bill would do, uh, it would force platforms like YouTube to push content on Canadians that we don't really want to see, that we're not interested in, but happens to be Canadian. The problem with that is if you're pushing Canadian content in Canada, but it's things that people really aren't interested in, if they don't click on it, YouTube's algorithms get the message that this content is not popular with viewers. And what it does is lower the visibility of that content beyond Canada's borders. So all kinds of Canadian content 
content creators have come out and said, this is going to hurt our ability to succeed beyond Canada's borders. And this will be a net loss for Canadian content creators. So you've got people all over the spectrum. There's a great uh, Indian Canadian creator, uh, Tesher, who found success basically uh, when his stuff was discovered on the other side of the world in India and Pakistan. And only then, once he was popular over there, did he get popular in Canada. He has oh said goodness. in an op-ed in, in the Regina Leader Post that his career never would have started if Bill C-11 was law. My goodness. Well, it sounds like some of these content creators might decide to leave Canada if they're under such extreme restrictions. Who knows? We're going to pick up this discussion in just a few moments. Welcome back. We are unpacking C-11 with Jay Goldberg of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. And once again, C-11 is the online streaming, uh, some called a censorship act, that is working its way through the federal government right now. It's with the Senate. Jay, we have heard how, and you've explained it very well, how online content creators from Canada will definitely lose exposure and perhaps even profits from their markets around the world and, and the ability to be able to make a living off this. Are we going to see an exodus of creative Canadians who say, you know, we've had enough, we've, we're going we're gonna to move countries? That's a very big risk. It is because a lot of content creators uh, are mobile. Uh, you know, this is the, it's not normally people who are working in a physical office who have to go there. These are YouTubers. These are people who are on TikTok. And so they could just simply pick up and move. And I think that's another big risk that the Trudeau government is not actually looking at. We've got people who are very mobile. We're in a very internationalized time. And, and certainly we've seen, you know, Canadian artists all the time. You see, uh, you know, Justin Bieber has largely moved to the United States. Other Canadian celebrities have largely moved to the United States. Content creators could be next. And so I really think the Trudeau government has not considered the impact this is going to have on content creators. If they stay in Canada, it could ruin their careers. Uh, the other option is they could leave Canada and then, you know, we'll simply lose Canadian content altogether. So I think this is a very bad piece of legislation. I don't think it was thought through. I don't think the minister genuinely knows what the impact is going to be on Canadian content creators and on Canadian content as a whole. And I think really the, we really need the Senate to, you know, stand up against this very dangerous piece of legislation. I've been glad to see that they've been doing a lot more scrutiny than they did in the House of Commons. Uh, and we'll see what happens from here. So do you anticipate uh, that the Senate will put forth any meaningful amendments? So they actually already have put forward at least one meaningful amendment, which is to try to exclude user generated content from this bill. So they're trying to make sure that if, you know, the average Canadian uploads something to YouTube or TikTok, that it would not be regulated. Uh, their rules are trying to say, well, only people who, for example, are songwriters who have already put out their music. Uh, you know, if Justin Bieber wants to post something on YouTube, that would be regulated. But if, you know, I were to post something on YouTube, that wouldn't be. Uh, that's that's an amendment that was put forward by the Senate Committee of, on Transport and Communications. That's a positive thing. We'll see how far it makes it. Um, but what we do know is because the bill is being amended, it will go back to the House of Commons and the government is going to have to face scrutiny on this once again. My goodness. So do you have any anticipation that it can be fixed? Is there a fix for this kind of legislation? No, I don't think there's any real fix for the legislation because it is deeply and inherently flawed. Uh, this is a bill that claims to pr want to promote the welfare of Canadian content creators, but could actually destroy their careers. This is a bill that says it's all about spreading Canadian content around the world, but it's censoring Canadians. It's censoring our ability to speak out. Uh, it's, it's stopping our ability to make our voices heard and choose what we see first online and what we read first online. And I think this is just something that Canadians don't want. We don't want the government telling us what we should look at first, what we should look at last. That's not something we're interested in. I think it's a deeply flawed bill and it really has to go. The Senate has made some improvements at the margins, but there's no, there's no genuine way uh, you can fix a bill that is so deeply broken right at the right at the core. So do you see that Canadians are speaking out? You know, sometimes 
Canadians get a bad rap for being too polite or, or too quiet or too calm. Um, you know, the one anomaly to that was the Freedom Convoy. <laughs> Their Canadians erupted. Can we expect a similar eruption? Or are, are, do you feel that Canadians are really voicing their concerns with this? Or is it, are they just going with whatever the government's flow is? Well, I would say at the CTF, we, we've got a petition going. We have well over 100,000, getting closer to 200,000 signatures on our petition, calling on the government to scrap this bill. I think Canadians are engaged, but I think we need to be even more engaged because this really is all about stopping government censorship, making sure that we control what we see online and that we don't have the government do it for us. Uh, and so this is a dangerous bill and it's a dangerous road to go down. And we know that the government has other bills planned, Bill C-18, which is the Online News Act. They've got all kinds of other legislation that is in this vein, uh, you know, toward government control and a lack of accountability. So, you know what, Canadians, we do have to stand up. Uh, we can't be quiet on this issue. We've got to sign petitions. We've got to call our members of parliament. We've got to call senators. And we need to make our voices heard. And we need to make sure that we do everything we can to stop Bill C-11 from becoming law. Okay, we're going to pick up this issue when we come back after this commercial break. Stick around. Welcome back. We're wrapping up our discussion on C11, and we're also going to talk about the Ontario Economic Update since we have someone from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation on. Thank you again, Jay Goldberg. Before we went to commercial, and I want to wrap up C11, you mentioned some potential further encroachments coming down the pipe. Could you explain those briefly? What what can we foresee happening with further encroachments? Sure. So Bill C Bill C eighteen is being considered right now. That's the online uh, sorry the online news act. And essentially, uh, this is another very dangerous and deeply flawed piece of legislation. Uh, it would require, for example, uh, Facebook. If you were to post a link to a news article on your on your wall on Facebook, for example. Uh, it would force Facebook to pay that news outlet money uh, based on the fact that you've posted a link to their material on your site. And obviously, Facebook doesn't want to do that. Facebook has literally come out and said, we will stop Canadians from sharing news on Facebook. We will stop those news updates that we put uh, on the side of the screen for people to see. Uh, stop that altogether. So Facebook has said, uh, if Bill C-18 goes through, they might just have a moratorium on news on Facebook for Canadians. And so this is yet another dangerous piece of legislation that could stop Canadians from being exposed to a diverse, uh, broad set uh, of views and opinions online. And this is yet another very flawed legislation. Uh, people are like Dr. Geist are very concerned about this. And I think this is really just following the footsteps of C-11. And then we could see further bills down the line as well. Wow, it's a, a very slippery and rapid slope, clearly. Uh, let's shift gears for a moment. Uh, let's talk about Ontario. You're the Ontario director here, and we've had a recent economic update this late in this fall. Could you share with us some of the highlights? We have about three minutes, but uh, touch upon that because I'd like to hear what happened there. Well, we've got some highlights and some lowlights. I would say that, uh, you know, we got good news earlier this fall that the Ford government last year Ran Ontario's first surplus in 15 years. It was a $2.1 billion surplus, but that was almost entirely because Canadians were forced to pay and Ontarians were forced to pay more taxes because of inflation. Because, of course, with a sales tax, it's simply based on the percentage of the good. So if the good becomes more expensive, sales tax revenue for the government uh, grows as well. So we had a surplus. That was a good thing. Unfortunately, in the fall economic update, the government has said they plan to go back into deficit. They plan to have four more years of deficits. I don't think Ontarians want to see that. I think that a lot of people are finally thrilled that we weren't adding uh, more and more to the mountain of debt here in Ontario. And of course, we're the most indebted sub-sovereign government in the world with $450 billion of debt. Uh, that's huge. We're spending more than a billion dollars a month on debt interest. That's I don't crazy. think that's something... Ontarians want to be doing. Uh, and I guess more on the positive side, we did see the Ford government extend the gas tax, the 5.7 cent per liter gas tax cut. It's been extended for another year. That's something the CTF was pushing for. Uh, we, we're now seeing the Ford government agreeing to that. And so that's a good thing. The deficit part is definitely a bad thing. So a good plus, I like to give praise where it's due. So I'm glad that they did extend that 
gas uh, cut, the gas tax cut. I, w- I thought it might have been just an election ploy, or maybe it was perceived as that. Maybe it was overtly an election uh, trick, uh, treat to give out. But now to hear that they're extending for another year, that's, that's excellent news. Very concerned about the surplus, because as you indicated, that's because we've had high inflation and Canadians are paying more out of pocket to the government. Are they getting more back in return? No, unfortunately, Canadians aren't. I mean, we've got that gas tax cut, but look, everything everything is up. You're paying more on income taxes because your income's a little bit higher uh, due to cost of living adjustments, but people are still falling behind because inflation is far outpacing wage growth in Ontario, and that's something that's very concerning. And of course, with the sales tax, as prices go up, the amount of sales tax you're paying goes up. And so, you know, the, the CTF, we just submitted a few weeks ago, our pre-budget submission to the Ontario government, and we're encouraging the government to cut the sales tax. Their sales tax revenue is way up. What we need to see in this province is controlled spending and lower sales tax to put more money back in the pockets of Ontarians all across the province. And by all indicators, it seems like it will be a tough winter and possibly spring as interest rates and inflation continue to soar. Jay, it's been a great uh, um, having you on today talking about C11 and, of course, the Ontario Economic Update. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Well, C11 is definitely cause for concern for many Canadians and not just online content creators, but to you as well, the taxpayer, the citizen. Surely you don't want the government interfering in what you can and cannot access online and what interfering in algorithms so that your viewing is impacted if you watch YouTube or Netflix. For CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granikowski.